Ladies and gentlemen, namaskar. Welcome to the 13th edition of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival in association with Nexa at Charbagh. We are delighted to introduce session 109, My Name is Why, presented by Rajasthan Patrika, the leadership series. Please join me in welcoming the man of the hour, Lem Sisse, who will be sharing his very moving story with us this afternoon. We request Lem to begin the session by reading an excerpt from his book. We also have Nandini Nair, the literary and cultural editor of Open Magazine. She's worked as a writer and commission, commissioning editor in the feature section of the Indian Express and the Hindu. Nandini would be joining Lem shortly on stage. Let's welcome Lem with a huge round of applause. <laughs> Jeffrey, it's such an honor to be here. My name is Lem Sisse, and first I will be reading from my book, which is uh, my memoir, which is called My Name is Why. Um, I'm in India. I'm in freaking India. I love it. I love it. <laughs> What an incredible place with incredible writers. Uh, I'm a total fan of Jeet Tail and have been for years. And I've read his latest book. It's called Lo by Jeet Tail, the poet. And it is incredible. Um, I've just read it. Um, chapter one. No, the preface. Books are the only place that we use the word preface. We don't say to our friends, we're going to go out tomorrow, but let's have a preface at my place. At 14, I tattooed the initials of what I thought was my name into my hand. The tattoo is still there, but it wasn't my name. It's a reminder that I've been somewhere I should never have been. I was not who I thought I was. The authority knew it, but I didn't. The authority had been writing reports about me from the day I was born. My first footsteps were followed by the click, clack, clack of a typewriter. The boy is walking. My first words were recorded, click, clack, clack, the boy has learned to talk. Fingers were poised above a typewriter, waiting for whatever happened next. The boy is adapting. Paper zipped from typewriters and into files, and the files slipped into folders under the S section of a tall metal filing cabinet. For 18 years, this process repeated over and over again. Click, clack, clack. Secret meetings were held. The folders were taken out and placed on tables surrounded by men and women from the authority. Decisions were made. Put him here. Put him there. Shall we try drugs? Try this. Try that. After 18 years of experimentation, the authority threw me out. It locked the doors securely behind me and hid the files in a data company called the Iron Mountain. So I wrote to the authority and I hand delivered the letter. The reply informed me that I had to write to customer services Customer services replied to say that they were not permitted to release the files. The authority placed me with incapable foster parents. It imprisoned me. It moved me from institution to institution. And yet now, at 18 years old, I had no history, no witnesses, no family, in 2015, following a 30-year campaign to get my records, 
the chief executive of Wigan Council, the local government, Donna Hall, wrote me a letter. She had them, my files. Within a few months, I received four thick folders of documents marked A, B, C, and D. Click, clack, clack. On reading them, I knew. I took the authority, the government, to court. How does a government steal a child and then imprison him? How does it keep us it a secret? This story is how. You'll know, um, could I get myself in the monitors here to the sound person? No? Okay. It's okay. Um, you'll know that the British have been stealing children, um, little children, little babies, for a long time. There's a history of it. I won't talk. I'll read. So this was the first time I'd seen my files. Uh, there's no camera here, but is there a camera here? Is there? A okay, this is a picture of me. <laughs> I mean, anybody would want to steal that baby, right? <laughs> and the first time I saw a photograph of me as a baby is when I was 40, 40, uh, 45 years of age. This fell out of the files. Each uh, verse, each file begins with, with a verse of poetry. So I was fostered by a, a family, and um, I'll begin on chapter four. Raise me with sunrise, bathe me in light, wash all the shadows that fell from the night. I developed a sense that there was something wrong with me around the time I began attending junior school. R. L. Hughes' Infants was my first. It was straight up at the top of Osborne Road. We'd normally walk with mum when she could take us, but later I reached the age when I could walk on my own with my brother. I liked the exact curvature of the earth of the school grounds. The green grass went on forever, and the football field and running track. The neat 1960s buildings, I preferred it to home. There was less static in the air. Mr. Graves was the headmaster. He entered the hall each morning and stood near the monkey bars with his arms behind his back. They said he was an officer in the army. The music teacher sat in front of the piano. Mr. Graves gave a solemn nod and the pianist would begin with the prelude while peering over her glasses and then we would sing the song we also sang occasionally at church. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. I looked at my head, thank you. I looked at my head teacher in awe. This is a printout of the reports from the social worker. After the school holidays, Christopher, that was my brother, will be starting at the same school. And it will be interesting to see what happens because Norman, that was my name, does not like Christopher to be better at him at anything. So this could possibly spurt him, Norman, onto effort or on the other hand, 
he may give up if he feels that Christopher is beating him. I hadn't realized at any point that none of what I have told you so far is true. I wasn't a happy child. I was a deceitful one. I was causing problems for everyone. It must be true. These are the words of Mr. Graves, the headmaster from the social workers' report of January 1976. So in the book, I have printed the reports from the files that were written about me for 18 years by the local government. This is what the headmaster of the school said about me, said by the social worker. Spoke to Mr. Graves several times on the phone and eventually visited the school. He felt that Norman's successes were too many. Too many for Chris to cope with. Went on to talk about another placement for Norman without any consideration of how the boy might feel. I put it to him that it was the only home the boy had known. I told him that another placement was out of the question and went on to inform him of what I had discussed with the foster parents themselves. We talked about specific incidents in the school when Norman's behavior had been inappropriately rewarded. He is never going to learn to cope with disapproval if approval is all he is being exposed to. The boy is going to meet with negative attitudes being unreasonably displayed to him at some time or other, and one wonders how he will cope with this when he is entirely unused to it. Spoke to Norman's class teacher. It was obvious that the boy had had a very special place in this school. Staff, domestic staff, give him preferential treatment. Norman has to experience more realistic handling and attitudes towards him have to undergo a change but not reject him. Headmaster will keep in touch with both children, about both children, visit to foster home, Norman's scene. I loved life. I was nine. My brother Christopher was eight, and I loved school, and I loved him, and I showed my love for him by punching him. We had the same rivalry most brothers have. We fought with unbridled determination the way brothers do. We wrestled, we sweated until one of us invariably Christopher would burst into tears. Catherine and David, my foster parents, had no children when they took me. Christopher was their firstborn, but I was their first. I was the eldest. I love my town. I love my family. I love the sibling rivalry. I love the market. I love the flower park, the big park, the books, the church, my friends. The head teacher suggesting to the social worker that I be moved for the sake of Christopher couldn't have happened in isolation. Norman's successes were too many. How could a child's successes be too many? The social worker said, Norman doesn't like Christopher beating him. Of course he doesn't like Christopher beating him. He's my brother. Something was at play. Something I didn't understand. Norman's behavior had been inappropriately rewarded. He is never going to learn to cope with rejection with disapproval, if approval is all he is being exposed to. This inclines me to think that my foster parents must have spoken to the head teacher prior to his speaking to the social worker, as there is no counter-narrative in the files. All I can tell you is what my parents told me. My mum was my mum forever and she was a nurse. My dad was my dad forever and he was a teacher. And my brother and sister were my brother and sister, and this was our town. But I couldn't help giving my brother a Chinese burn, because uh, that's what brothers do, isn't it? Uh, chapter 5. <coughs> Smoldering embers in the sky above, anger is an expression in a search for love. This is from my reports. 
28th of the 7th, 1975, from The Social Worker. I called to see Norman today. The family have returned from their holiday in Scotland. Mrs. Greenwood was upset. Thank you. It seems just this morning, Norman repeated what he had been saying, doing most mornings while on holiday. He is getting up in the early hours and eating sweet foods, particularly biscuits. He has eaten as many as two packets. Norman says he is sorry for his behavior, but cannot promise not to do it again. I was eight years old, for the record. I did steal biscuits, but not two whole packs. This exaggeration would come back to haunt me. What I did was this. I stole biscuits from the biscuit tin and then rearranged them in the tin in a stacked roof column system to hide the fact I had stolen them. Genius. One holiday in Scotland at my granddad's home, the family left me in the cottage as punishment for lying about stealing cake. Sarah, Christopher, David, and Catherine walked down the hill to Loch Inver. I thought I had been locked in my room, but the door was open. I sobbed my way downstairs. The rich smell of silver birch wood from the embers of the fire filled the front room. Wiping tears from my face, I saw on the table a half-cut ginger cake. The tears evaporated. Maybe I can have a slice, I thought. If I cut it in exactly the same way as it was already cut, then no one will notice that I've taken a slice. Genius. And so I did. McCavity was cleverer than that. The cake tasted so good that I figured one more slice wouldn't do any harm. There were no witnesses, but then there was only one suspect. It tasted so good. So I did it again. To this day, I don't know why I got into this habit of stealing biscuits and bits of cake, but I did. They told me I was devious. The problem was that was my first instinct was to say I didn't steal the cake. I hadn't considered that the reason that they had left me in the cottage in the first place as a punishment for stealing cake with cake on the table. Still, I denied that I had stolen the cake. McCavity would have had much more guile and more style. And soon enough, after another hour in the bedroom, I realized that I had to admit to taking the cake. What I didn't realize was the significance of my transgress transgression. The lies worried them more than the theft, they said. This habit of stealing cake was the crack in the dam. There was something bad in me, something I didn't understand. Don't you look at me with those big brown eyes, was the strange refrain my mum would shout. I didn't understand what she saw. If I argued that I didn't know what she saw, then would I be lying? How could I see what she and my foster father saw? Back at home, in the front room, it's where I was punished. Same place we entertained visitors. Same place the books were. Same place the social worker would sit. The leather sofa was polished to perfection and smelled of pledge. Stealing cake and lying about it was an indication that the devil was working inside of me. The front room is where I was caned. I loved the normal stuff. The middle room where we mostly lived and watched the clangers and crackerjack on television. The files tell a different story though, a story narrated by my foster parents and filtered by the social worker. Within three years, it will be reported that I threatened to kill the entire family, except for baby Helen. Normally, in England, I would read the next chapter, which is chapter seven, and it is about my foster parents after I left them and after they put me into care and said that they would never speak to me again for the rest of my life, 
and left me in institutions in which I was imprisoned. Would you like me to read that chapter? That's a resounding no. You should never give the audience the opportunity to answer the question unless you are absolutely sure what it is. And if you don't believe me, ask a teacher. So I'm going to read it out of defiance. Thank you. And for that woman there who held her hand up, which was not for me, apparently. It was for her friend. <laughs> it's a good gig, Lem. Keep going. I've got a voice in the back of my head and it's going, you crap, get off. I've got another one and it's going, no, you're doing all right, carry on. I've got one in the middle and he's saying, you two separate now. <laughs> the poet has to get used to the, the memoir. <clears throat> this is how you lose an audience in four minutes. Chapter seven. So I had to learn about what happened to me and about the relationship with my parents, my foster parents, by not being with them. Most of us learn about our parents as we grow into parents or as we grow older. I left them at 12, never saw them again except for once, and I worked this out from the memories pre-12. Chapter 7, dawn is awake for dusk, light will find what it must, what will be will be and thus shadows speak for us. The journey to Winnick became an often, oft repeated one throughout my childhood. Dad always stayed in the car when we got there. He stayed with Sarah because Sarah was too young. Winnick was a sprawling red brick institution set in manicured greenery. It was the picture of order and quietude, covering up all of the secrets and lies. Me, Mum and Chris walked through the front door to an archway. And after Mum signed a register, we stepped into the wide tiled corridor of the asylum. It smelled of vomit, bleach, savlon and urine. Our footsteps were louder here and followed by sharp echoes. Haunting moans peeled into the air as we stepped onwards. A nurse appeared as if from nowhere and rushed past us. Chris was chewing his lip and getting paler and paler. He developed a nervous habit of sucking his upper lip, leaving it dry and chapped. Our long journey in this other world led to a public cove, a room uh, with winged armchairs in it, with women in them. And I scanned the room slowly and noticed that none of the women were right. They were holding their heads all wrong. They were strange, dribbling creatures. And then Mum spotted one of them and stepped quietly over to her. The woman had an overhang to her mouth, wolf-like, dribbling, hair like a nest, a snapped twig. There was a familiar shape to her eyes. This is Auntie, Mum said. Say hello to your Auntie. I pulled myself together. Hello, Auntie, I said. I liked her. She liked me. I could see a twinkle in her twisted, slow eye as her bent head rocked back and forward and her twisted elbow pushed out a clawed hand towards me and brushed my cheek. She couldn't speak, but her grunts were enough for me to know. Chris twitched and managed a mumble. Mum took out a hanky and lovingly wiped drool from Auntie's mouth and chin. How long did we spend there watching her rocking back and forth? I knew instinctively not to ask questions as we headed off. Mum visited her twin regularly, sometimes alone, sometimes with us. My auntie had been like that from birth, her twin. And as children have a sense for these things, I realized that no one mentioned her, not grandma, her mum, or my mum, 
her sister. My grandmother, Phyllis Munro, never visited her daughter with mum and us. I wonder, does Catherine, my mum, does she believe that she took the away, away took away the what her sister needed? What a thought. People can be cruel to themselves. People can be cruel to each other. Was my mum born in shock that she had survived her sister? Did she blame herself? Did her mother blame her? Was Catherine living with a constant sense that she was not good enough because she had taken the air from her sister's brain? She would do everything to prove otherwise. She would foster a black baby and show her mother, who was a foster parent too, that she was good in spite of what she had done to her sister inside her mother's womb. I honestly believe that if my mum could have changed places with her sister in the asylum, then she would have. Nature can be cruel, but at least it's honest. It's not the doings of the devil or of God. My auntie hadn't done anything wrong. Her sister hadn't done anything wrong. Her mother hadn't done anything wrong. This was not a curse for sins. If they could all let themselves see that this is the beauty of nature. My mother's twin sister was beautiful. She was as beautiful as any catwalk model and her mind as relevant as Alice Walker's. It's not my aunt who has the problem. It's my grandmother who couldn't look at her and whose subsequent hatred of her other daughter, my mother, caused my mother's inescapable feeling that she didn't deserve to be alive. No Christmas and no birthday would rid my mother of the feeling that her twin sister had a birthday and a Christmas too. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. There were two other sisters, Ruth and Sue, and a brother called Alec, my uncles and aunts, and I think Sue was the adopted one. Ruth's portrait hung in my grandmother's front room above the fireplace, and it hurt my mother, but not because she would take anything away from Ruth. It was because my mother felt her picture would never be on the wall because it would remind her mother of her other daughter, the one we visited. I was born into a laburnum tree family with its poisonous bloom and its, its beauteous bloom and its poisonous seeds. I saw grandma at least once a week and I loved her. Maybe she did love Catherine Greenwood, the twin who survived. Maybe she loved her so much that she couldn't show it because to show it would have made her feel she loved her sister in the asylum less. Maybe Catherine was her favorite the one she fought for, the one who survived. She was the first, but Catherine never felt it and consequently found love difficult to give and even more difficult to receive. Grandma Munro was always cutting her down to size. The disappointment inside mum deepened and I guess it explained her begrudging discontentment with others. The parent and daughter reinforced each other's dysfunctional behavior like rutting stags, stags caught in each other's antlers. In fact, all they wanted of each other was love. This was the great rift. Catherine was the first daughter and Phyllis was the first mother and the other daughter was in an asylum. This is how anger is stoked. Bitterness rots the vessel that carries it. None of this is in the files. Grandma was a registered foster carer with the local council, like her daughter. Rings! I never saw any other foster children there. The only time I knew of a foster child being at her house was when I was sent there. Duncan Munro, granddad, was an outpost an ex-whiskey-drinking, motorbike-riding maverick from Lochinver. 
We holidayed there at every opportunity, and before settling down with Grandma, Grandad would often get mad drunk in Loch Inver, jump on his motorbike, and ride at the treacherous cliff edges like a hurricane. And now and again, I'd catch glimpses of that wild hang Highlander. He was a rugged, left-wing, free spirit. From 7 to 11, Mum would send me to stay alone at my grandparents'. My grandma was so overrate, it would eventually kill her. She ruled over my mother with a rapier tongue and a cynical, withering look, which could reduce mum to tears. Grandma Munro, the queen of the chessboard. There wasn't space for grey areas, for black or white. There was black and white, right and wrong. There was little time for reflection. I can still hear the emptiness of the school song mocking, mocking and echoing down the corridors of the asylum. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Was there something cruel in this family? A strong undercurrent threatening to drag me out into the wide ocean. Was there something about this family that locks its damaged children into places they can't be seen and then punishes itself for the guilt it feels? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for kindly listening. Um, I'm always aware that I'm speaking in English in a country which English is not the first language. But I must tell you that I don't, there are more people whose language that I understand, no, there are more people whose language I know that I don't understand. Does that make sense? <laughs> and it'll be the same for you. My throat. Oh, my throat. And the fact I can't hear myself in the monitors, so I'm, I'm trying to hear myself from the sound that's going out there, okay. which meant that I was pushing my voice more than I normally would. This, I, I can hear myself more now. And the voice is a beautiful thing. It has, it has all kinds of tones and messages within it that we are not aware of even ourselves. And, um, and when one can't hear one's voice, one throws, pushes it, so it becomes more monotone. It, be, it starts to dance in, in a very, uh, very, not monotone, it starts to have the same rhythm. There are many poets who read on stage, and what they do often will stay in the same rhythm of tone. Actually, not just poets, page poets do this as well. And, and they take away the, the, the beauty of the line. What happens is, they're like snake charmers. They, they, they perform the poem in the same tone over and over, no matter what they hell way say, right? The same tone of voice, reading, just dismissing the sentence. And what happens is they get stuck in the rhythm. It's like they're snake charming. And the snake comes out and they're like, oh my God, I've got a snake coming out in the same rhythm of voice. Let me keep going. But what they don't realize is the snake is hypnotizing them so that they don't hear their own words. They're so involved in getting a rhythm of voice that they lose what the voice is saying. Sorry, so I'm fascinated by sound and by uh, etc. So anyway. Maybe we, that can lead us to Sorry, our first... Sorry, that's totally off message. No, no, first question. Um, how different is it to read your prose compared to your poetry? Because I've watched video after you, yes. video watching you. <laughs> as a poet, and I recommend that highly. It's absolutely mesmerizing. You Thank do, you. Thank you. You do feel like a snake at a snake charmers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> the prose world is very different to the, the world of the poet. Um, and I'll, I'll just, yeah, book sales. <laughs> you know, there are more book sales in, in prose than there are in poetry. That I do know. Um, but um, it's just beautiful when you read to an audience and they have 
Um, as many have either read of the book or heard of the book, etc. Um, it's, a, it's a natural progression, actually. A lot of poets write novels, write short stories, write plays. Um, it's, it's, it's not often that you will find a, a poet who's been a poet by profession for uh, you know, 10, 15 years. It's, it's not often that you will find that they haven't done other things, written um, lyrics for uh, uh, music, etc., or written plays. Or um, I don't think that's a modern thing, by the way. I think that, that, goes, that goes right back. Um, Simon Armitage, our poet laureate, uh, has written plays, written radio documentaries, written. Uh, I'm sure he's written. Uh, I'm sure he's written uh, lyri lyrics as well. Yes, and I know he's written novels and memoir as well. So, so he, so when the uh, the writer finds them, if if a poet feels like they are, you know, alone in the world writing their one poem and uh, they're not connected with the wider world, it's just not true. Um, it's just not true. It's something I'd like to tell young writers, you know, it's like get in touch with the world, you know, because, because it's good. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I think during your reading, you sort of went on an aside and you said, no, I'll continue reading. Yes. Um, and there's a word you use in your memoir called yes. when you were taken away from your mother, your birth mother, it was a land grab. It was a land grab, yeah. Um, and I thought that was an interesting term, especially because it's a it's literally like colonization in a do you know, way. Do you know when Shashi Taro, you know Shashi Taro? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I know you're looking at me like, really? <laughs> you're really asking us that question, Lem? But you know when he wrote the book, uh, you, the, the, did he write a book about Churchill? No. He didn't write a book about Churchill. He's got an idea about Churchill. Okay, okay he has a, a very articulate idea about Churchill. Well, in England, that is, that is not necessarily a popular idea, <laughs> okay? So, does that make sense to you? You know, in England, that, that is not a popular idea. Yes. Okay. <laughs> in England, Churchill is seen as, you know, he's on the news every day. He was on the news yesterday. Boris Johnson wants to be a little like Churchill, and as he puts some weight, he's starting to... He's, I don't mean that in a weightless way. I mean, you know, he really is starting to... to just well, it's very similar with taking children from around the world and bringing them to England and stealing them. I was stolen from my mother when she was in England. There's no, there's, no, there's no question about that. I took the government to court and I proved that. The idea that the best thing... You saw the film Lion. The idea that the best thing for a child from India or a child from Africa, the idea that the idea that the best thing for that child, if they are poor and in need, is for them to be taken to England, is, 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 um, is, is corrupt. That is a corrupt idea. Okay, it, it is an idea that has been corrupted by a sense of entitlement. And, and when my mother landed in England in 1967, which was the, a few months before the Enoch Powell speech, when she was sent to the north of England to have the baby which she was pregnant with by the man who'd escorted her to England <laughs> from Ethiopia, she landed inside the corrupt dysfunction of British society. Firstly, the mother and baby homes where women were press ganged into signing the adoption papers when they were at their most vulnerable on the bridge between childhood and adulthood, and mainly Irish women. Because a pregnant woman who was without a husband in England in 1967 was an estrogen terrorist. She had to be locked away and her child had to be taken from her for the betterment of the state and the betterment of the church. My mother landed in England 
in the middle of that, found herself already pregnant, was sent to a mother and baby home in the north of England with the primary purpose of having her child taken away from her. She said, no. The social, she said, I want this child fostered for a short period of time while I study, and then I will take my child back with me. The social worker gave me to foster parents and said, you can't adopt him because obviously we can't get her to sign the adoption papers because she won't, but we'll get her to sign them. And he's yours forever and his name is Norman. Freaking Norman. <laughs> the foster parents wanted to call me Mark after Mark in the Bible and their last name was Greenwood. Norman Mark Greenwood. Now there is echoes of this name changing within the society in England that goes right back. There is a history of this. And by the way, there is a history of taking children from other countries that goes right back. If you want to know about that history, have a look at the National Portrait Gallery and see those pictures. If you want to know about where this, this, this need to save little babies from other parts of the world is from, have a look at Queen Victoria. Have a look at how she liked to get herself a little prince or a little princess. There is a history to this thinking. It didn't just happen out of some sort of like, but you know, some benevolence out of the blue. I know this, that adoption is the greatest thing that one human being can do for another period. Because a child will test every single part of you. A child will test you emotionally, physically, politically, spiritually, on every level. So to adopt is the greatest thing a human being can do. I also know that there are too many people who have been transracially adopted who are my friends and who are just wonderful human beings for me to say that it doesn't work. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I am saying that to do it and not understand the history of it is to be, a, it, it, it's a very dangerous thing to do. So they stole me from my mother. At 12 years of age, the foster parents decided they didn't want to carry on with it. So they put me into children's homes and said they would never speak to me again, ever. And then I was held in a series of children's homes, one in which I was imprisoned. And then at 18 years of age, they let me go and they said, oh, by the way, your name is not Norman. Because legally, they had to give my birth certificate to a responsible adult. But there were none. There was no parents and no mother, father, sister, brother, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents. So they had to give it to me. And my birth certificate had my name on it. Lem Sisse. And the social worker was so angry with what happened to me that he said, somebody did love you. And he gave me a letter from my mother pleading for me back to a social worker whose name was Norman. The social worker who gave me to my foster parents named me after himself and then disappeared. This is the this is, this is psychosis, institutionalized psychosis. So from the age of 18 years old, I started my journey to find my family. And I found them all over the world. My mother married the vice minister to uh, finance under the emperor, Haile Selassie. My father was a pilot for Ethiopian Airlines. The revolution happened in 1974, and Ethiopians from my mother's class had to spread all over the world. And I've been all over the world, and I've met every single one of them. And who do you think my mother saw when she saw me? I was around the same age of my father when I found my mother. So she didn't see me. She saw him and the memory of him which was my conception. And then you might ask yourself again, 
Why is he called the question why? In other words, in Ethiopia, you have a patronymic naming system. This has taken me a lifetime to work out. Yeah, I, I won't go on because, because, because the, thing is, the thing is, when you find your family, you bring a story. And it is that that families fear, a new narrative. All families are, are stories that we tell each other. And we get frightened when somebody contradicts that story. I'm the fall guy for the, for the foster parents' family. And every family has a fall guy. And that fall guy could just be a memory, something that we will not explore, something that needs not to be said, otherwise the whole, the whole thing will fall apart. The whole thing will fall apart. This is why Christmas dinners are difficult in England. Well, that's another story. What but don't we say? Sorry, um, sorry, sorry, I am no, no, really no, railroading, no, no, aren't I? No, you have this great description about what a family is, and you say that a family is essentially those with whom you can verify memories. And if you don't have yeah. that, um, you don't have a family in a way. Family is a set of disputed memories right. between one group of people over a lifetime. Um, and oh, okay, we're running out of time. I and know, we, it's such a shame. Oh, I want to talk. Man. <laughs> we have but lots yes. of questions, but I have to ask a question from Rajasthan yeah. Patrika. Yeah. Um, and the question is, which is quite a nice one, what do you think makes a good story? Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what makes a good story, but I know it when I see it. I know it when I read it. That's okay. as good as it's going to sure. get, I'm afraid. Um, do we have audience questions? Have I just stunned you to silence? Or to sleep, one or the other. It's okay, I'm cool either way. Or uh, you talked about how you His voice is clearer than mine. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, go on. You talked about how you couldn't disagree with the results of this, uh, of this program. So do you believe that it is overall beneficial as a program to do this to, uh, to kids who are in bad situations, like to give them a new family and not tell them about it? Oh, that's complicated. Sorry. Could, did you... Did you, is your question about not telling adopted children who their family is? Sorry, I didn't get uh, Do you think that it is overall beneficial to take children who are in poor situations or like in situations that they cannot uh, survive and put them into another situation with questionable Wonderful question. Needs? Wonderful question. I think there is something really good about children being able to go to different parts of the world to get education, to get, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think it's a good thing to take... The, if I say to you, I will take your child and give them a good education and a good life. And let's say we have a middle NGO who can make that happen. So that's what you think. But if I, two people down the line, tell the people on the other side of the world, you can adopt this child and it's yours forever. That's where the mistake is. So there is nothing wrong with a poor child... Um, being accessed to anything around the world, uh, to, you know, living with other families, fostering, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. even adoption. But what there needs to be is a very clear, honest line between the parent and between the, uh, the the birth parent and between the adopting parent. Does that make sense? And that's where a lot of the trouble is. There are, you know, Ethiopia stopped international adoption because. A lot of the parents from the rural areas, from the rural areas, were under the impression that their child would be coming back, but it was going to get a good education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That it was transactional. Yeah. Uh, good question. So I'm not against it. It's much more nuanced, you know. The reason Ethiopia stopped international adoption is because it was a land grab. Sorry. Yeah, what? Hello. Yeah. Wonderful Hi. session. I just wanted to ask that for an adopted child who does not have parents, yeah. does she or he have to know later on before she 
starts her own family that she's an adopted child. Okay. Does, does a child have to know their adoption child? One of the great problems with our society and adoption is that for some reason, we think of an adoption as something shameful. So we feel like we shouldn't say. Like it would make you worse or less. If you want to know how great adoption is, see the film Lion. You know, you know, you know people who have give birth to a child themselves, they will say, you can never know love like, like a child that you have given birth to. This is a very arrogant statement. Because the person who gave birth or because the father suddenly feels a great sense of love, he or she feels that nobody else can have that unless they have that experience. And it's not true. An adopted mother is a mother just like a birth mother is a mother. There is no shame. Shame is in wider society. Harry Potter was fostered. Superman, Superman was adopted. Batman. Batman, Romulus and Remus. I mean, we are Jesus. fostered. Jesus had two dads. You know, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Muhammad. So, you know, Muhammad, yeah, Muhammad was, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was, was uh, adopted by his grandmother, right? You know, we are front and center in popular culture. And we need to think about that because that will benefit that question. When do you tell a child that they are adopted? Well, if you were to tell them about Muhammad, about Jesus, about Moses, and say, you were like them. Or Lisbeth Slander, who's one or of Or Lisbeth Slander, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Should we take that one there? We've got 2.45. And can I thank William Dalrymple for asking me to bring me to this incredible festival. Thank you, thank you so much. He saw me, he was like, oh, you've got you to do it, and you follow through, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I absolutely loved the talk so far. So I was just wondering, did you start off writing the book as a cathartic process to process your own experience, or as a way of assimilating your own ideas, or was it for other people? For me, writing is not therapy, therapy is therapy. If, 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 if writing books was therapy, I would be able to go to a session every week and just put my book on the other side. <laughs> and just talk to myself. You know, writing books is essentially bad therapy in many ways, in my opinion. So the answer to your question is, no, it wasn't cathartic. I got my reports from the government, and then I said, I took them to court, I won. And then I said, right, now I'm going to tell the story of what you did to me. Uh, but it was a great question. Thank you. I think we have, there was a hand there. Yeah. 130. So. Yes. And you got your papers after a 30 year wait. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, congratulations on your novel and Thank this you. amazing speech and your journey. Thank you. Um, my question is a little bit personal. What was your overwhelming sense of emotion when you first met your mother? Your oh, when I mother? first met my mother. By the way, when you write a memoir and somebody asks a question and says, this is a little personal, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I've put a lot out there so you can ask that question. Um, it was wonderful to meet my mother, but anybody who has a mother or who is a mother knows that it is a complex relationship. So uh, meeting her was wonderful, and as we grow, uh, we come to understand each other's complexities, which is basically family. Now, as Lim says, he's a member of a very dysfunctional family. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. I now have a dysfunctional family just like everybody else. So that's, I'm <laughs> part of the team. Exactly. So I think we're out of time. And thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. And um, the book is at the bookshop. So please, please get we your copy. We got somewhere. We did get somewhere, <laughs> didn't we? I think we did. We did. Okay. And thank it's, you. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We wish to thank Lem Sisse and Nandini Nair, along with our sponsor Rajasthan Patrika, the Leadership Series, for this very emotional and gripping session. Do note that Lem will be available to sign his books at the book signing desk, located right at the entrance of Charbagh. If you could please line up and make this convenient for him, it would be really great. 
The next session at Charbagh is the Shadi story, behind the scenes of the big fat Indian wedding. It would begin shortly. I request the audience to kindly occupy the front rows first and to also put their phones in silent mode. Thank you so much. <laughs>